Hi, thanks for taking time out of your day to learn about how gluten affects the body, brain, and gut. If you're following a gluten-free diet and you're still experiencing symptoms, this video is for you. There's a lot of information here, so grab a pen and paper. You won't want to miss anything. We all know that gluten causes a lot of issues for people, including physical pain, emotional pain, gastric issues, and can also lead to many more health issues. So what exactly is gluten? Why is it bad for us? If you Google it, gluten, you'll find the typical answer that gluten is a family of proteins found in wheat, barley, and rye. But there are other factors involved in gluten allergy or sensitivity, not just these three grains. So let's examine this for a moment. Grains are actually the seeds of the plants, right? You got that? They're seeds of the plants. But most people don't know that seeds are hard to digest. When you consider the sheer quantity of grains a normal person eats in a day, bread, buns, muffins, donuts, cookies, cakes, gravies, sauces, canned soups, pasta, and more, their caloric daily intake could be more than 50% from grains. Keeping in mind that grains are more difficult to digest, what does this tell you? It tells us that gut is working overtime just to keep things moving. Filling up on these grains causes the gut to slow down and among other things causes leaky gut. Now, before we delve into the leaky gut aspect, I just want to make it clear that when I say grains, I'm talking about all grains, not just wheat, barley, and rye. All grains are difficult to digest. So what's the first thing we typically do when we eliminate gluten from our diet? We reach for rice, right? Rice bread, rice cookies, rice cakes, rice flour, everything rice. Am I right? But wait, rice is a grain. Oops. So, okay, if we can't have rice, what about corn? No, that's a grain too. Just like buckwheat and oats. If you're celiac or gluten sensitive and you still have symptoms, you might want to consider ditching all grains, at least for a month or two to see if that's your problem. Typically, you should start to notice a reduction in symptoms within a week or two, but it might be very slight at first because your system is so overloaded with gluten that progress may be very slow. You might even be experiencing withdrawal symptoms, something I'll talk about a little bit later, which actually makes you feel worse for a while. Stick with it for at least a month, preferably two, before you discount it. Now, back to leaky gut. In case you don't know what that is, it's microscopic perforations in the gut that allow what's in the intestines and the colon. Yes, people, I'm talking about poop, poop, yes. Poop leaking into your body, creating havoc and causing bloating, gas, diarrhea, inflammation, pain, and infection. 
we now know that gluten can cause those little perforations, allowing the poop to constantly leak into your bloodstream, in effect, poisoning you. You see, the bloodstream is supposed to deliver the good things like vitamins, minerals, phytochemicals, carbs, fats, proteins, the micronutrients, the macronutrients our bodies need to provide energy and the building blocks to build and repair itself. The gut is the processing center, the place where our food is digested and separated into the good stuff and the bad stuff. It sends the good stuff into the bloodstream naturally. But when there are perforations or little holes in the gut lining, then the bad stuff gets mixed in with the good stuff. And there's an internal war going on, which causes an immune response. When our bodies are focused on the immune response, expending huge amounts of energy in a continuous battle to keep us safe the immune system becomes overreactive. As a result, you can't digest your food properly. And you can even become malnourished, even though you're eating well. If you're eating good foods, but the nutrients aren't getting through, they're going to waste. Being now malnourished hinders the body's ability to heal and repair itself. We already know that infection can trigger autoimmune disease. We also know that emotional stress and trauma can trigger autoimmune disease. But something most people don't seem to realize is that diet and nutritional deficiencies, environmental toxins like chemicals and pesticides can also cause autoimmune diseases. Added to that, farmers spray the ground and genetically modified crops with glyphosate, commonly known as Roundup. The crops are sprayed twice before being harvested to dry the grain. Glyphosate is a desiccant and farmers want the grain to be as dry as possible before harvesting so it doesn't spoil. Glyphosate is also used as a herbicide, getting rid of the weeds so crops are not fighting for nutrients. This, of course, can only be done with GMO crops that have actually been manipulated to include glyphosate right into their DNA so the crops don't die when they're sprayed with this toxic chemical. Even though you wash your foods, you get rid of the excess chemicals on the outside, you're not getting rid of the chemical that's impregnated into the DNA of the plant. You're eating that. After harvesting, the grain is then dumped into a huge grain bin and sprayed again, this time with anti-mold chemicals. But it's not 100% effective. So some mold still grows on the grains, forming mycotoxins, which can cause kidney damage, cancer, and inflammation. Some people end up with one form or another of arthritis. We'll only focus for a moment on rheumatoid arthritis to keep this presentation from becoming overly long. <laughs> Doctors generally prescribe methotrexate for rheumatoid arthritis, or pretty much any arthritis. In case you didn't know, methotrexate is actually a cancer drug, which suppresses the production of DNA. Other drugs doctors commonly prescribe include biological medicines possibly even steroids or non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, which destroy the gut. And guess what? Those drugs also destroy the immune system and they don't even really work to preserve the joints anyway. 
which means patients eventually end up in surgery to replace those joints. Exactly what they were hoping to avoid when they took the drugs. And then after surgery, recovery is often impaired due to the nutritional trauma and biochemical damage caused by the drugs. It's a little known fact by the general public that omega-3 helps relieve chronic pain. Doctors will sometimes prescribe it, but not very common. To be clear, omega-3 helps relieve chronic pain without compromising your organs or destroying your gut. Sounds good to me. Next, we focus on gluten. It also has a correlation to rheumatoid arthritis, as well as other conditions. Let's take this step by step. If someone with chronic autoimmune pain fasts for 48 hours, that means they don't consume any solid food whatsoever for that period of time, and they drink only clear fluids, guess what happens? Their pain, more often than not, goes away. Hmm. Could the pain possibly be related to the foods we eat? Today's foods contain so many preservatives, herbicides, and other chemicals that just weren't there 100 years ago. Point in case, glyphosate. Since GMO foods were introduced over 50 years ago, there has been a dramatic increase in autoimmune diseases, cancers, and chronic pain. There are far too many people nowadays dealing with chronic pain, whether it's caused by fibromyalgia, various forms of arthritis, disc degeneration, or autoimmune diseases. They struggle daily and are very frustrated with the standard of care that doctors routinely dole out, suppressing the symptoms and destroying the health. Have you ever sat in the doctor's office trying to find a solution for your chronic pain and fatigue or anything else really? And the doctor says, well, I'm not really sure what's going on yet. So let's monitor this. And if it gets worse, come back in and we'll see what we can do. Big help. Sad to say in today's fast paced world, it's difficult to find doctors who actually care enough that they're willing to spend the time finding the reason, the root cause of why you're presenting with these symptoms, not just slap a Band-Aid on it and call it done. You know, that's not going to do anything. Oh, I mean, taking painkillers will relieve the pain for a little while, but it won't solve the problem. And it could wreck your gut or even other organs. A functional medicine doctor is someone who will get to the root of your symptoms. You mostly find them in the US. Unfortunately, we don't seem to have them here where I live. Um, I mean, okay, maybe there might be one or two in the big cities, but we're very far away from that. So the closest we can get to is a naturopathic doctor, but they're just not the same. And the expense can be astronomical, especially for seniors or those on disability who don't have the disposable income to spend. Trust me. This horrible pain is not the quality of life you're looking for. You don't want to be stuck in the house all the time, barely able to move, sleeping your life away, unable to play with your kids or grandkids, unable to clean your home or even attend social functions. I'm Mark Rakoski. 
and I went through this myself. Three years ago, I could barely move. I had to grab the handrail and physically pull myself up the three steps to get to the bathroom. It was excruciating and debilitating. I was frustrated and sad over losing my mobility. Even more frustrated and sad and angry because the doctors offered no help. Since then, I worked hard on my recovery, constantly searching and trying new things. I mean, if the doctors weren't going to help, I had to do it. I had to figure it out. I'm so grateful I didn't give up because now I can walk again like a normal person without having to use the cane. Well, at least most of the time. For full disclosure, I do still use a cane if the ground is uneven or if I have to walk a long distance. And it's more for support in case I trip because the last time I tripped and fell, I fractured my spine. To say it mildly, that hurt a lot. The doctor said I could have easily been paralyzed for the rest of my life if the disc had moved even a fraction of an inch more. Mama ain't got no time for that. No more falling and causing myself harm. I'm just grateful that I don't need to use the cane very much, but I'll take it. Thank you very much. In my search for relief from pain, I found that gluten was causing a great deal of it. But I also experienced chronic physical pain as a result of childhood trauma. Who knew that something like emotional trauma could manifest into physical pain? Especially so many years later. Chronic pain is not a one-size-fits-all disease. It can have roots in many different areas. Some get it from food, others from allergies. But there are also many who experience it due to emotional, physical, or witnessed trauma, mostly from things that occurred during childhood. So back to gluten. How do we actually fix your gluten symptoms? Well. We can't cure celiac disease, at least not yet, but we can reduce or eliminate our symptoms. Obviously, the first thing to do is fix your diet. I mean, of course, you know, that's just common sense. Fix your diet first, but that will in turn fix your gut, assuming, of course, you aren't taking drugs that cause digestive issues. Gluten is well known for causing inflammation, which also affects the brain. Forgetfulness, foggy brain, exhaustion, physical pain, emotional pain, and crankiness are all symptoms of inflammation. There's inflammation in the brain. There are hormone imbalances, but the digestive tract is particularly at risk because it's extremely sensitive to the wrong types of food, especially if the gut is already inflamed. There are people with celiac disease, that's an actual allergy to gluten, which can even be life-threatening. And there's non-celiac gluten sensitivity, which can also cause distress. Interestingly enough, there are very few cases of autoimmune disease that don't have a gluten problem. So we could go directly into fixing the trauma that caused some of these symptoms. But honestly, if you don't fix the diet and the gut first, then you're going to have a more difficult time reducing or eliminating the symptoms. On the other hand, if you only fix the diet and gut and then totally ignore any emotional component, 
you may not find the relief you're hoping for. Emotional issues and trauma have a way of popping up when you least expect it, like an unwelcome guest. <laughs> Just because you may not be aware of the emotional event, don't think your subconscious and body don't remember it. Unless emotional issues are resolved, your subconscious and your body never forgets trauma. Uncomfortable events and emotions put the body in a constant fight, flight, and freeze mode, continuously pumping out excessive amounts of hormones and chemicals with no job to fulfill. So they start attacking the body in ways you might not even suspect. You've likely heard me talk about different types of trauma emotional, spiritual, physical, biochemical. Well, biochemical trauma isn't just about the environmental chemicals we experience on a daily basis in our food, the air we breathe, the products we use. It's also about the wrong types of food, food sensitivities and food allergies. This is where many people check out. They stop all the good they've been doing to regain their health because they can't physically see what's happening inside their bodies. And besides, they don't like giving up gluten. Sure, they may feel a little bit better if they give it up, but there's a tendency to hide their heads in the sand thinking, oh, it can't be because of that. And the belief that it's too hard to get better. Isn't there just a pill I can take? I'll never get better. I can't give up my favorite foods. What will I even be able to eat? Even if it means feeling crappy for the rest of their lives, don't be an ostrich. Now, don't get me wrong. A lot of trauma can be cured by dealing with the memories and emotions that are attached to them. But if gluten and environmental factors like pesticides and other chemicals are involved, you still may not get rid of the pain. All of the factors need to be worked on in order to gain freedom or at least a reduction from your symptoms. Don't ignore the biochemistry, just as you cannot ignore the emotional trauma. Many people who were exposed to chronic stress that started in childhood don't even realize they've experienced trauma. They don't identify it as being a capital T trauma like rape, incest, war, murder, death of a family member, divorce, etc. Because that's the only trauma they believe exists. They don't understand that there's also a small t trauma like an everyday occurrence that causes discomfort, incessant teasing or being ignored, always being the last one chosen for a team at school, getting a bad grade, saying or doing something you regret. Those are all small t traumas. Those who have suffered trauma feel frustrated, confused, sad, angry, overwhelmed, but they don't know why. They don't realize these symptoms generally creep up years or even decades later after the event. You may even experience trauma from all the gut-wrenching pain associated with your gluten allergy or sensitivity, or feeling alone, unable to trust anyone, being left out of social events, being afraid of going through all that pain again. Those are more small T traumas that are often ignored or misunderstood. Since celiac disease is an autoimmune disease, this is an important thing to remember because adverse childhood experiences cause biochemical trauma which we just discussed, 
and more often than not ends in one or more autoimmune diseases. How many people do you know with an autoimmune disease who have more than one, maybe even several? Now, don't expect your doctor to help you change your diet or even discuss your nutritional needs. You'd think doctors would be well-versed in nutrition, right? Wrong. Sadly, traditional medical training only scrapes the surface of diet and nutrition. In fact, doctors don't know much about nutrition at all. They were trained to treat symptoms, mostly with prescription drugs. Yeah, I know, more chemicals. To be fair though, some prescription medications are absolutely necessary to keep you alive, yet they all come with side effects and even some potentially harmful ones. And to top it all off, many issues we see our doctors about end up with no diagnosis at all. That's happened to me a few times. Doctors don't delve into the whole body systems to see what's actually causing the symptoms. They don't want to spend the time trying to solve the puzzle. They only want to move you out of the office quickly so they can get to their next patient. What does that mean? They look at how to reduce or eliminate the symptoms. Newsflash, these symptoms are our body's way of telling us something is wrong and we'd better address it before it's too late. If we continually suppress those symptoms, the underlying condition is allowed to continue getting worse and worse. And eventually we may find ourselves beyond the point of no return. Something that bears talking about is doctors promoting their own supplements to treat your condition. They often make them sound like the supplements were created specifically for you. This is, in effect, just a way of lining their pockets with your hard-earned money. They're in it for the money, not necessarily to cure you. There are a select few, however, who do provide excellent education and treatment along with marketing their supplements. Just don't be drawn in by all their too good to be true promises and hype. They may or may not work, or they may not work any better than the less expensive supplements. Use your own judgment and obviously avoid them if they contain gluten or grains. To be clear, I'm not saying all these doctors are bad. Just beware. Did you know that gluten is addictive? It's our comfort food, our, our feel good food. Think about pasta, bread, cookies, cakes, even ice cream. Yes, even dairy has the same opiate qualities as grain. I'll be talking about this a little bit later. When we feel unsettled, anxious, angry, sad, we reach for our comfort food, right? It just makes us feel better, at least while we're eating it. Oh, we crave comfort food, don't we? But then if our comfort food includes gluten, we experience uncomfortable digestive issues. And maybe even a day later, we start to feel physical pain. We feel depressed, we feel anxious. That's the gluten working on our bodies. Did you know we often crave the very foods we're allergic or sensitive to? That's true. For instance, when my cousin was young, 
she was allergic to peanut butter. Every time she ate peanut butter, she would break out an eczema between her fingers. Oh, it would itch and burn and the, the skin would break open and oh, it was just horrible. But she loved peanut butter, it was her favorite food. She craved peanut butter. So when her mother wasn't looking, she'd grab a huge spoon, the biggest she could find, dip it in the peanut butter jar and scoop out as much as she could. Then she'd run and hide out of sight and eat it right off the spoon. Of course, she'd pay for it afterward. But what I'm getting at is this, the craving to a food that she was allergic to was so intense, she just couldn't help herself, even though she knew what it would do to her. I love bread, especially nice, fresh, crusty bread. Even better if it's still warm from the oven and slathered in butter. Oh, pure bliss. But I discovered that whenever I ate it or anything else containing gluten, I would get these gut-wrenching cramps and diarrhea within 20 minutes. And all my joints would be inflamed and painful the next day, making it almost impossible to move, let alone walk. Many people have family members and friends who don't believe in gluten allergy or sensitivity because the effects are invisible to others. It's sad and frustrating when others think your health issues aren't real or don't matter. For a long time, my husband didn't really believe in my gluten sensitivity and was always complaining about the cost of gluten-free food. I know it's more expensive than regular food, but what are you gonna do, right? You gotta eat something. At the supermarket checkout, he would, oh, he would embarrass me. He would actually say, ka-ching, 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 when my gluten-free foods were placed on the conveyor belt. Oh. How embarrassing is that? Until one time when we attended a potluck, I wanted to try a delicious looking dessert that someone else had brought. I specifically asked what the ingredients were. Cream cheese, cherry pie filling, and whipped cream. Hmm, cool. I scooped some onto a small plate and just took a little bite. Oh, it was heaven, but I was confused. The texture seemed a little off. I couldn't quite put my finger on it. I took another small bite. Oh no, that's when I realized my friend had forgotten or didn't think it was important enough to tell me that there was cake on the bottom. You see, some people just don't believe it matters. And some others just try to trick you so they can say, I told you so. And I couldn't tell at first because all the ingredients had sort of melded together and the cake wasn't even visible. I quickly handed the remainder to my husband who scarfed it down. <laughs> Long story short though, when I woke up the next morning, I could barely move. I even had to get help from my husband to get out of bed. My whole body was inflamed and I was in so much pain. All I could do was slowly shuffle to the bathroom inch by inch, hoping to make it in time. My husband asked me if this was a reaction from the dessert the previous evening. Yes, that's when he finally believed in my gluten sensitivity and said, that's it, you're never eating gluten again, ever. Eureka, finally, since then I've never had to justify 
choosing gluten-free foods. Similarly, corn gives me gas, bloating, cramps, and diverticulitis. Remember, corn is a grain and all grains are difficult to digest. I actually ended up in emergency twice due to corn. However, I find I can eat organic non-GMO corn with no problems as long as I don't overdo it. This may or may not work for you, no promises. <laughs> but for me, that's the difference between traditional corn, which is GMO corn sprayed with glyphosate and organic corn with no chemicals. I'm so happy I can eat corn again because it brings back so many happy memories of when I was young and we had picnics with extended family. So much fun. Let's face it, none of us actually wants to give up our favorite foods, our comfort foods. But if we truly want to heal, it is a small price to pay for being symptom-free or almost symptom-free. You may still experience some flare-ups, but there will be fewer of them and you'll enjoy more quality of life. I mentioned before that gluten is addictive. One of the byproducts of gluten is gluteomorphin 7, which is a type of morphine. Dairy is also addictive. The opioid created by the digestion of milk protein is called casopmorphin. Morphine? These opioids hit the neurological receptors in the brain, making you feel all warm and fuzzy inside, numbing your pain and just plain making you feel good. This is why we say gluten and dairy are addictive. And it's because of this morphine addiction that often there are withdrawal symptoms involved when cutting out gluten and dairy. Things like headache, depression, mood swings, worsened gut problems, lethargy, flu-like symptoms, and more. That was the worst part for me, the withdrawal symptoms. But I managed to get through them, and I know you can too, because we can all do hard things. But unfortunately, many people give up at this point. They don't realize that it's just a temporary situation caused by detoxing. They just think, I gave up gluten and look what happened, it doesn't work. And sadly, they go back to their gluten-filled diet along with the painful symptoms. You know that grains are carbohydrates, right? Well, if your daily carbohydrate ratio is 40% or higher, that could cause an overgrowth of fungus in your gut. Remember that some people's diets consist of 50% grains? That's 50% carbs, right? And more if you count things like fruit and veggies. To be fair, fungus is normally found in your gastrointestinal tract, but those are the beneficial microorganisms, not the toxic ones. The microbiome, which you've probably heard about before, contains the helpful bacteria. But there's also a mycobiome, which contains the helpful fungus microorganisms. However, too many carbs cause fungus to multiply, creating an overgrowth, which can result in candida. You've all heard of candida, right? Pretty uncomfortable, something we'd like to avoid, right? Do you know why candida is so bad? It produces a hyphal wall protein. Weird name, I know. I don't even know where that comes from, but this hyphal wall protein actually mimics gluten. So if you've been faithfully following a typical 
gluten-free diet by eliminating wheat, barley, and rye, and you're still having symptoms? Maybe because you're consuming too many carbs. It doesn't matter where the carbs are coming from. Too many of them means you're feeding an overgrowth of fungus, which in turn creates proteins that mimic gluten. In addition, if you consume foods with yeast, oh, you may have yet another problem. Yeast produces several more chemical toxins that can actually alter your thoughts about food. How does it do that? It makes you crave sweets. I'm sure most of us have had a craving for sweets, right? I mean, I know I have. These cravings brought on by an overgrowth of fungus can be overpowering, just like my cousin with her peanut butter cravings. How do you overcome these powerful cravings? It's hard. I mean, it's really hard. Well, my favorite way to eliminate cravings is with an AFT session. AFT quickly helps you figure out the problem and eliminates the craving for good. It really does work. It's an amazingly simple process that quickly gets to the root of the craving and basically erases it for good. If I didn't know better, I'd say it was magic, but I do know better. It's based on science. Other than AFT, if you want to try to go it on your own, you can try vitamin C, B complex and niacin, but there's no guarantees that they will work. You can tough it out through sheer willpower for three or four weeks until the cravings naturally pass. But honestly, it's difficult and not always sustainable. It's really hard to resist your favorite comfort foods when all those around you are still eating them. Remember what I said about these cravings being overpowering? They, they rule your mind until you finally give in and then they've won again. And here's the kicker. If you haven't resolved the emotions that allow your cravings to continue, then you'll likely only last so long without them. Eventually, you'll start to crave sweets or other favorite foods again because your body perceives them as comfort food. It remembers how the opiates made you feel. So the next time you feel stressed, unloved, overwhelmed, or sad, you might find yourself reaching for them sometimes before you even realize it, which then starts the merry-go-round all over again. How many movies have you seen where boyfriend dumps girlfriend, girl rushes home to the freezer, grabs ice cream, gorges on spoonful after spoonful right out of the container. She doesn't even take time to get a bowl. To top it all off, sugar feeds yeast. So the yeast multiplies even more quickly. For yeast overgrowth, you can, of course, take prebiotics and probiotics. You can eat copious amounts of organic active yogurt that has no fruit or sweeteners in it. It does take a lot, though, so be prepared for the long haul. Or you can get a prescription from the doctor. Oh, and before I forget, antibiotics actually deplete all the good microorganisms along with the bad ones. So if you take antibiotics, you should definitely eat lots of organic yogurt and or supplement with prebiotics and probiotics. Phew, that's a lot of information, right? 
Now that I've given you some insights about how gluten affects the body, brain, and gut, and why you could still be experiencing symptoms or cravings, I sincerely hope you'll utilize the information to make your life better. If you'd like to join my gluten-free group on Facebook, along with over 3,800 other members, feel free to send a request to the link I'll post below. If you would like to follow my page, Unlimiting Yourself, Finding Joy and Abundant Health in a Toxic World, I'll post that link below as well. If you'd like to schedule an AFT session with me, email me at hello at withmarg.com. That's hello at w-i-t-h-m-a-r-g.com. We'll have a short conversation to see if I can help you, and we'll take it from there. If you'd like to visit my website and check out my blog, etc., just go to www.withmarg.com. Thanks for watching. I hope you learned something new. If you enjoyed this video, please follow me on YouTube. And don't forget to click the little bell to receive notifications when new videos are added. Leave me some comments as well. I'm always finding ways to help others achieve healthier and happier lives. A little support from you goes a long way and actually spurs me on to keep doing what I'm doing. So please leave those comments. Thanks again for watching. I'll see you soon.